everyone. It is so nice to see you in the building. It's nice to have you on the live stream. Welcome to church. Uh, once again, it is such a pleasure to meet with you in person uh, or uh, technologically uh, in the very least. Uh, Peter writes of the people of God. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All that is truly good and lasting in this life, it comes from God. And the right response, says Peter, well, it's to proclaim the praises of the one who has brought us out of darkness and into his marvellous light. Let's offer up that praise together, out loud if you're on the live stream, uh, and perhaps without singing if you're in the building. Once, once again, thank you for joining us. One of the things that uh, we like to do as a church and is right for us to do uh, individually and collectively is to confess our sins, to understand our right place before God as sinners uh, in light of what he has done for us. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, I'd invite you to say the words that will be up on the screen uh, in confession of our sins. Uh, please join me. Most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way. 
We have done wrong and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit that we may live as disciples of Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. Uh, John goes on to write in verse 9 that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, Please turn to the screen. Rick is bringing us our kid spot this morning. G'day, I'm Rick, and this is a Rack Sunday Kid Spot, Young Lives Changed by Jesus. I'm looking for things that are glorious, and my kids made some videos today that they said were glorious. Let's check out their glorious videos. This first one's from Ed. Ed came to the garage. What's he doing? It's a popper. That was glorious, Ed. But what? Oh, Sydney, New Year's Eve, fireworks. That is even more glorious. This one's from Pete. Pete on a skateboard. This is glory, kind of, kind of glorious. Oh, what, what's this? What's this kid doing? Spins and balancing on one wheel and up a, and a, oh, I don't even know what that was called. And whoa, now that, that is glorious skateboarding. This next one is James. He said he was going to do something glorious on a bike. Where is he? Where is James? On a, oh, here he is, uh, kind of glorious. He didn't fall off, but um, don't know that it was. Wow, wow, those flips. Now that was far more glorious. Oh, it's Gus. What's Gus doing? I missed it. I think he is actually better than that. Oh, wow, that is glorious. Look at that slam dunk. What, what do we have here? This is strange. There's fire on a mountain and it looks pretty... Is that, is that my dad? Oh no, I know what this is. This is a movie showing when Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. Look at that. That would be glorious. Being on the mountain and seeing God himself writing the law on the stones. That was glorious. How good to be one of God's people in the Old Testament. To have the law of God given to you by God himself. How glorious for Moses to see God face to face. And how glorious for God's people to see Moses' face shining with the glory of God. That was glorious. Another video, Rouse Hill Anglican Church. What's going on here? This is us. Oh, wait a minute. I know what this is. The Old Testament glory faded away, but the ministry of the Spirit where the Bible is opened and read and taught and people have fellowship together, this is the glorious ministry that never fades but will last forever. This is more glorious. People serving one another in love, encouraging each other, being transformed to become more like Jesus. This is the most glorious ministry of all, and it will last forever. We have it here every Sunday at 10 and 5. How glorious is this? Thank you to Rick. Uh, We're going to now open our Bibles and read... Uh, Two parts of the Bible today, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Uh, If you have a Bible in some way, shape or form, I'd invite you to turn to Exodus 34, verses 29 to 35. Exodus 34. As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands as he descended from the mountain, he did not realise that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near 
and he commanded them to do everything the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. After he came out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded, and the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Our second reading today is from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, recognised and read by everyone. It is clear that you are Christ's letter, produced by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on stone tablets, but on tablets that are hearts of flesh. We have this kind of confidence toward God through Christ. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our competence is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit produces life. Now, if the ministry of death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, so that the Israelites were not able to look directly at Moses' face because of the glory from his face, a fading glory, how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was fading away was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not stare at the end of what was fading away, but their minds were closed. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Thank you, readers. Well done. Uh, I hope you're going to keep 2 Corinthians 3 open in front of you uh, as we kind of crack through it this morning. I'm Glenn. I'm part of the ministry team. If I've not had the opportunity to meet you before, uh, and why don't we pray as we kick off? Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, we ask this morning as we look at your word that you would give us uh, open ears and ready hearts. Father, we pray that your spirit would so work in us that when we hear your message of hope, the the good news of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, that you would help us to welcome it, to uh, take it on board and into our minds and in our hearts and then apply it to our lives. We pray this morning that you would make my weak words strong so that your strong gospel might be better heard. We pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, Everybody loves a transformation show, don't they? Uh, One of Katie and my guilty pleasures in the recent past was uh, watching shows about people buying these busted down old shacks, making changes to the inside and the outside and then going on to sell them for what I can only assume are astronomical profits. 
Uh, you get these people just ripping into walls, smashing things with hammers and axes. That's my favourite bit. But then they uh, create rooms and spaces. They establish looks and other buzz phrases that I don't entirely understand, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, and you get to see this awesome way that a person takes a look uh, at this run-down, tiny, almost unusable house, work on it for a few weeks, spending, I assume, lots of money, uh, as well as time and effort to transform it into a house that someone would be proud to own. It's impressive, it's exciting. I, I think we love a good transformation show because I think it shows us that things can get better. Now, I don't know that we necessarily want to start thinking about uh, starting a pitch to a TV studio for flipping churches or Church Renos Australia, but maybe you're sitting there wondering, could our church do with a little bit of sprucing up? Maybe not to the building, uh, but to the inside, to what we do. And you might be right. There might be a few things that our church can do better. But Paul in 2 Corinthians wants us to know that what transforms the church is not a, a, a coat of paint, it's not a flashy, impressive personality or a, or a big, impressive speaker, it's actually the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of Jesus' followers, transforming them to be like Him. Today, as we dive into 2 Corinthians 3, we're going to see that the Spirit of God is who transforms God's people. We're going to see uh, that His transformative work is beyond compare and we'll be challenged and I think really encouraged to hold tight to the Gospel because the Gospel is the means by which the Spirit of God works to transform God's people. See, Paul kicks off this bit uh, by appealing to the church at Corinth and, and I think us as well, uh, to look past the things that our world says makes a person worth listening to and to actually listen to Paul's message because it's the gospel. It's the message he has been given by Jesus and sent out with by Jesus. The gospel, <laughs> let me try that again. The gospel is the message Paul has been given by Jesus and Jesus sent Paul out with it. Paul's talking to a church uh, that desperately wants him to commend themselves to him in a very worldly sense, to speak eloquently, Paul, to show yourself to be worthy of people's adulation, to be influential, to be powerful. Now, there were some con men in and around Corinth who had come along after Paul had planted the church there, and they were actually much more, in, a, in that worldly sense, they were much more impressive than Paul. And the church was kind of starting to wonder, you know, was, was Paul all that? Should they maybe start to think about jumping ship and, and following somebody who's just a bit more impressive? The early church uh, had this history, it had this thing uh, of uh, letters of recommendation that Paul kind of mentions in the early verses. It was this common practice to kind of stop frauds and, and people who wanted to harm the church from kind of getting in and doing damage. And in many ways, 2 Corinthians 3 is a letter of recommendation of Titus, the guy who's carrying it to them. Uh, if you read ahead, and I recommend that you do, have a crack at the rest of the letter, uh, you're going to find in chapter 8 that recommendation of who Titus is and why he should be listened to. But Paul refuses to commend himself that same way. Paul doesn't want to impress the church at Corinth in a worldly sense. He loves them far too much to rely on his own human greatness. But he had some. We read in Philippians 3 that Paul should be impressive in that worldly sense. But instead, Paul takes the time here in 2 Corinthians 3 not to point at his own greatness, but to point away from himself, to point to the work of the gospel in his own life and in the lives of his hearers. The fact that the gospel changes lives and draws people into the church is actually the 
the recommendation that Paul points to, the, the evidence, if you will, of the transformative work of God's own Spirit. Now, you may not realise how much the Spirit has been at work in transforming you, but Paul tells us here that if you're a follower of Jesus, well, he says, you are Christ's letter, not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now, as most of you know, in a, in a, I think it's in about a month, but it might be in two months' time, uh, in the coming months, I'm going to be uh, moving to Darwin to take on a role with the Defence Force. And while I'm going to miss all of you, I'm not just saying that, I legitimately will miss all of you, uh, there's a particular group here at church that I'm going to miss the most. That's my Infinity Youth Group leaders. It's because of how much of an encouragement they have been to me over these last years. Our present leaders are not the team that were leading when I came on board. Most of our present leaders were actually in high school when I started working here. But as they left school and showed a, a real willingness to love Jesus, they, they showed that, that key element of knowing God and being known by Him. We, we recruited them as leaders who would share the gospel with young people. With Well, they were young, but people even younger than them as well. When they were recruited, they were young, they were inexperienced, and therefore really likely to make mistakes. That's not me trying to criticise them, that's just the nervous reality you face when you're the youth minister and you've just recruited somebody to come and be part of your team. Each time, with each of these young people, I have been blown away by the steady transformation of God's spirit enacted in each of them. As they start to make their kids a priority, as they invest in the lives of a generation coming along after themselves, I see God's Spirit at work transforming young Christians, gifting them with competence and ability that is beyond what I assume is possible, time after time after time. God's Spirit has made them into my letters of recommendation and I am humbled and encouraged each and every time. Not because I'm an incredible trainer, I think we all realise that's far from the truth, but because it is God's Spirit at work in them. And so I guess my first question for you this morning is, is God's Spirit at work in you? Are you being transformed to be like Jesus? Now, these are hard questions to ask because as I ask them of you, I fully expect that you'll ask them of me. But even though they're hard, I think 2 Corinthians 3 really wants to challenge us, each of us, to take some time this week to reflect on what God is doing in your life. Because I think for many of us, that's actually going to be a great encouragement. Maybe you're, you're becoming more patient Maybe you're becoming more encouraging in the way that you speak. Maybe you're spending less time worrying about what others have and more time worrying about whether or not others have enough. Too often, I think, friends, too often we don't take the time to stop and reflect back to see what God's Spirit has been doing in us, which is a shame. Because taking that time will be a great encouragement, not just to ourselves, but to those around us, as we can start to reflect on what God is doing in them. And there's a flip side to that, though, isn't there? There's a nervousness that comes with reflecting on what God might or might not be doing in you. Because maybe you're not being transformed. Maybe you're not growing as you get to know Jesus better. It's worth asking if that's you. Why not? Back at a previous church, uh, I had a loving older brother in Christ point blank me on it, come and challenge me, why was I not growing in my faith? And at the time, I had to actually stop and recognise that for me, the blockage was me. The reason I wasn't growing in my faith was because I wasn't really listening. 
I wasn't regularly in God's word. I didn't prioritize prayer. I didn't make uh, an effort or, or, or even really try to do much when it came to gathering with God's people. See, God's spirit produces life in Jesus' people. What's he producing in you? More than that, are you encouraging the good transformation you're seeing in your brothers and sisters around you? Are you paying attention? Are you giving thanks for the ways that God might be at work in you and in others? See, Paul wants the church at Corinth and us to recognise how church transformation takes place. It's not getting flipped. It's not a coat of paint. It is through and by God's Spirit at work in faithful followers of Jesus. He wants us to look past things that the world says are exciting and to actually see the impressive work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of King Jesus' people. See, because it's that work, that transformative work, that is so glorious, as we saw in the kids' spot, that nothing in history, nothing in all of creation can match it. Paul wants his readers to understand that the work of the Spirit is so glorious, so utterly transforming of the life of a follower of Jesus that it makes everything that had gone before it less than nothing. Paul writes, if the ministry of death chiseled in letters on stones came with glory so that the Israelites were not able to look directly at Moses' face because of the glory from his face, a fading glory, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? That's verses 7 and 8, if you're just trying to keep track. See, Moses had led Israel out of slavery and to the promised land. Moses, by great, God's great power, established Israel, a bunch of runaway slaves, into one of the most prosperous and powerful nations in that part of the ancient world at that time. By giving them the law and explaining their status as the redeemed people of God, Moses elevated these former slaves to unbelievable heights. And here, in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says, that glorious endeavour was just a fading glory. Something that, when it's compared to the work of the Spirit, the work of freeing people from sin and death, ultimately, that glory amounts to nothing. It reminded me, as I was thinking through it this week, of a bloke called John Fairfax, who I'm sure you all know as the first person to ever solo row across an ocean. Leaving from the Canary Islands on January 20, 1969, it took John 180 days to land on a Florida beach, having rowed solo across a whole ocean. I'm getting some blank looks, so maybe not many of you actually know who John Fairfax is. I think I have a, a, an understanding of why. 19 hours after he set foot on the sand, two blokes, Lance Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, walked, walked on the moon, having crossed a far bigger ocean. See, what Fairfax did was amazing, wasn't it? It was glorious but it could never compare to what Armstrong and Aldrin did. Moses' work in bringing the law and leading God's people to the promised land was incredibly glorious. But when you try to stack it up next to the Spirit of God transforming lives, as he applies the ministry of Jesus' life-giving righteousness, Moses Excellent complexion cannot hold a candle to that glorious work of the Spirit applying the life-giving gospel to people. Do you see our time on Sundays or in your midweek groups as glorious? See, when I hear stories of Moses splitting seas and Elijah calling down fire from heaven, that sounds pretty glorious, doesn't it? That sounds like the kind of group I want to be a part of. Where do I get me some of that? And I think we can often get impressed by big expressions of power. 
It would be amazing to see Moses' face shining with the reflected glory of God. But if we want a church that looks glorious, fireworks and a smoke machine are not going to cut it. Powerful and captivating speakers are not going to get us there. A bigger band with more amplifiers and way more speakers are not really going to make our church look glorious, are they? See, what Paul shows us here in 2 Corinthians 3 is that the most glorious a church can be is when it shares the gospel. When the Spirit uses that church to free people from sin and death. It's seen as God works to change people through his word. We may not have the most glorious sound system here, but we absolutely have the best sound, my friends. The sound of the gospel being proclaimed week in and week out. People being transformed by the spirit and work of God. The glory of the transformative work of the spirit is unmatched and unmatchable. Paul wants us to recognise just how amazing it is that we have been transformed by God's own spirit at work in us. And therefore, having such hope, we use great boldness, Paul tells us in verse 12. Boldness to reflect God's glory freely and fully as we share the gospel that reveals God's glory. See, Paul goes back to that example of Moses, not because he didn't like Moses, he loved him, but because the con artists that were trying to uh, shipwreck the church in Corinth, well, they were of a particularly Jewish flavour. They were trying to lure the Corinthians back into a false worship, trying to draw the Corinthian church into uh, the old way of doing worship. The problem here is while the old covenant had some glory to it, it was a veiled or fading glory. It only lasted for a little while. That, that time had now passed in the coming of Christ. But more than that, Paul says of, of those caught by the old covenant, those who were part of that old covenant, that their minds were closed. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. Literally, the Old Covenant that was meant to produce worship and relationship in God's people had hardened the hearts of those who engaged with it. Israel would hear the law and time after time would respond by hardening themselves toward God. But now we have something so much better, don't we? Whenever a person turns to the Lord, Paul writes, the veil is removed in verse 16. Whenever someone hears the gospel and chooses to trust in Jesus, verses 17 to 18 tells, tells us that the Spirit removes the hardness of our hearts. It begins to work in us to make us more like Jesus, to reflect the glory of the risen Christ more and more each day. See, back when I worked for Crusaders, uh, there was this concrete bunker at one end of uh, one of the campsites. Um, decades earlier, somebody had very generously uh, given Crusaders a sum of money in their will because they'd greatly loved the work of crew and they wanted to resource it. So they set aside a sizable chunk of money in their will uh, for the building and maintenance of this particular structure. At the time, it had been a huge gift. It had enabled very good ministry to occur. But as time went on, the building ended up being a bit of an eyesore. And when the site went through a significant redevelopment, it actually ended up blocking a bunch of work that couldn't happen because of some of the legal things that were attached to the, the gift. What had been a great benefit began to cause bitterness and division amongst the staff and redevelopment team. It, it physically became a blockage to the work of making the site bigger and better and more able to reach more and more lives for Jesus. Even to this day, Paul writes in verse 15, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their hearts. 
the law, like the gift of that building, had become a blockage to the gospel. It's only when the law is fulfilled and someone looks openly and honestly into the gospel that that blockage can be removed and real transformational work can start to take place. I take it that this is both a challenge and an encouragement. The challenge is not to dilute the gospel with things that look flashy but aren't the real deal. It might be tempting when when someone's heart is hard, when they just won't listen to us, trying to explain the gospel. It might be tempting to, to make it sound just a bit more attractive. I think that's what motivates folks uh, to present the idea that the blessing of God is to make you wealthy or to make you healthy, uh, what often gets referred to as kind of prosperity theology. Or when well-meaning people uh, kind of downplay the reality of sin and tell people things like, God just wants you to be happy. Or love, no matter what it looks like, is God's gift. Even if what someone thinks will make them happy, or make them feel loved, will actually draw them away from the gospel, will draw them away from the God who loves them more than anything. Friends, don't ever dilute the gospel. Don't water it down or feel like you have to add to it, because it is only the gospel that transforms. It is only the gospel that makes us more like Jesus. And that's the encouragement, to keep persevering with the gospel because it's through the gospel of Jesus Christ that the the Holy Spirit transforms people from those who are under the death sentence of sin and into the glorious people of God. See, when it's hard to hold out the gospel, when we struggle because we keep getting told that we're on the wrong side of history or we no longer have any relevance... Remember, it's the gospel that reveals the glory of God. It's the gospel that holds the the majesty and the power of Christ to transform sinners like you and me into saints. There is no greater beauty, my friends, no greater privilege or reality than revealing Jesus to someone who desperately desperately needs his love and forgiveness. Nothing else has kept me going through all these years when I just had a new leadership team that just didn't gel or when I was uh, running a game at youth group and it just felt awkward or boring, when I was struggling to keep year nine kids focused on God's word, when all they wanted to do, Jacob, was run around and throw stuff at each other. My friends, when I was struggling, when I felt like I couldn't hold on, I kept going, not because I'm great, but but the glory of the gospel is so amazing that I couldn't help but follow him. Following the God who reveals himself to those who hear and transforming them by his glorious spirit. Because the gospel transforms, because the spirit-empowered proclamation of the truth about Jesus is the way people are made into the eternal saved image of God. Hold on to the gospel, my friends. Go boldly with it. We all love a transformation story, don't we? Because it shows us how much better things can be, how much better things should be. So what if we as a church long for the kind of glorious transformation Paul is describing here in 2 Corinthians 3? What if we took a hold of the gospel and shared it because we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt just how well it would transform folks into the saved people of God? Is that a church transformation that you want to be a part of? Let's pray that now. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you are the one who transforms, that you are the one who saves, that you use your gospel and your spirit to make that life-saving transformation in all those who hear, 
and respond to your gospel. Father, we pray that you would give us great boldness to share that gospel, to reveal your unsurpassed glory with everyone who will listen. And we pray it in Jesus' powerful and transformative name. Amen. Please stand and, uh, well, if you're in the room, hum, but if you're at home, sing loudly uh, as the band lead us in worship of our transformational God. Friends, um, some of you will have seen me up in video form or physically in the building uh, kind of pitching this 555 and uh, discipleship of young people uh, sort of idea. Uh, last Monday, a bunch of us came and heard from uh, Anne-Marie from YouthWorks who challenged us about ministry to children and young people. I'm going to invite Shannon up because I'm going to ask her a couple of questions because, uh, friends, while she's coming up, uh, the 555 um, discipleship setup has actually started. So if you're already, uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, if you're already subscribed to the daily devotional uh, sort of setup, you on Thursday will have gotten an, uh, an email that actually outlined uh, what the process is and it had a link to it. If you didn't get that on Thursday, uh, one, sorry, uh, two, 
how you subscribed to the daily devotional thing, getting the, the, week, the daily emails uh, for prayer and Bible reading, that would be a cool thing to lock down. And if you are and still didn't receive that email, I would offer two quick things. One, can you double check your clergy filter uh, on your emails to make sure that emails from clergy are not just going straight into spam? Uh, and two, can you come and chat with myself or Graham or Rick or one of the other ministry team and we'll just make sure that that's getting done and we can resend it to you. If you are subscribed, you're going to each day get the 555 uh, emails. Uh, what they are is five minutes looking at a bit of the Bible and some questions uh, to help uh, not just us get to know Jesus better, but also uh, for kids and young people in our families and things. Now, Shannon, you've been standing there very patiently. Come on up. I'm going to use my parade ground voice and hopefully I'm still getting picked up by the live stream. I'll just look pretty and that'll be fine because Shannon will give us all the important bits. Shannon, uh, you came along on Monday. Why? Why did you come um, along? So, yeah. I'm going to angle bit, that I'm down. A bit short. Yeah. <laughs> The wrong type. <laughs> so I came along on Monday um, primarily because I'm a mum of two small boys who are four and two. Cool and you guys come along here in the morning. Gareth has been busily uh, busting his gut making sure all the IT stuff uh, for the live stream all works. But, yep. uh, so when you came along and you heard Emery, uh, what did you find helpful? Yeah so um, one of the questions that we looked at was what is who is responsible for raising children to know about God? And um, we looked at a few passages about that, and the answer um, that was found was that it's the whole community of the church is responsible for raising children to know about God. Um, so that was really helpful um, to go home and chat to Gareth about, well, what does that look like in terms of partnering with the church to raise our boys to know God? Okay, now, it's helpful to know that it's not all my fault. <laughs> whether or not my children... No, no, no. Uh, it, it's helpful to know that we're working together as a community. Yep. Um, what did you find particularly challenging? Yeah, so um, the biggest challenge for me was um, I realised that we didn't really have an intentional plan to teach our kids about Jesus, that we were definitely winging it, um, and it's far too important to wing. Um, so we were given a list of resources as well on um, Monday night. So they're things that we will implement and we're going to do the 555 as a family. Um, but yeah, we're just going to pray about and, and read about um, ways that we can be really intentional to teach our kids about God. Cool. All right. Now, this is a bit of a loaded question. No pressure at all. Uh, would you recommend the training yep. uh, to anybody who's here or to a particular group of people? Um, well, I would recommend it to anyone because, like I said, it's, it's the responsibility of, of the entire church to, to raise children um, to know God. Um, I guess, personally, as a parent, I, I would definitely recommend it because my deepest longing for my children is that they grow up to know God. And any training that can equip me to point them to Jesus is, is worthwhile, in my opinion. Great, it's helpful. So, uh, a couple of quick things. I'll just kind of gather up some of that, yep. but also keep doing the pitch of the 555 thing. It's not because we make any money out of it. We just think it's really helpful. Um, the idea was uh, not just for parents, although obviously parents, we really want to resource you and we want to work with you on raising kids to know and love Jesus. Uh, but we also want to help our whole church see that we all impact kids. We all impact all of the kids in our kids' ministry, over in creche, in youth ministry, upstairs. And so as the youth minister, can I invite you to prayerfully think about how you might support youth children's and, and little children's ministry, if I can kind of break them into those three uh, categories. Think hard, because we would love your help. Uh, in addition to that, the 555 stuff is going to be really, really helpful uh, for families if they want to be, as you say, intentional about uh, sharing the gospel with their kids and, and showing the ki their kids just how glorious Jesus is, as we just heard from 2 Corinthians. It's always nice when the preacher can add in that extra little plug. Uh, but also, I think for all of us, it's going to be helpful to have those, uh, those good, clear gospel understandings, those good, clear gospel explanations uh, looked at e each week. 
Uh, now, the thing about the 555 is when I heard it, I heard it almost like a big burden, uh, that it was going to be extra work that I had to do, and I absolutely had to be home five nights a week so that we could read the Bible together. My wife is looking at me with a very sour look on her face, because she knows I'm not home five nights a week. But uh, if it takes a bit longer, that's cool. It's not supposed to be a very rigid sort of system. It's supposed to be a very helpful sort of thing to help us get to know Jesus better together as a church, but also so we can be supporting kids and youth growing up knowing Jesus. Thank you, Shimmy. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, uh, we're going to be back here. There's going to be supper from seven. Uh, we're going to be diving into looking at the Bible and how to answer big, hard questions. So rather than looking at some of that big picture why we do it stuff. We're going to look at some of the mechanics of how you answer big hard questions. Uh, now, I believe uh, there is a video going to be coming up on the screen. So if you cast your eyes to the screen. At Rousseau Anglican Church, we want to see lives changed by Jesus. Today, I'm interviewing myself. I want to help you to have in your head a pathway for outreach. Point one, share your faith. Following Jesus is the most important part of my life. It's fundamental to who I am. Following Jesus affects my priorities, every relationship that I have, all my decisions. It gives me hope for the future, comfort and suffering. It gives me joy. As I speak with people about anything in life, I can share my faith. There is no subject in life where my faith is irrelevant or unimportant. I've got a friend that I meet with regularly for coffee on an afternoon. Uh, and as we talk about life, it's become really natural for me just to share my faith and what it looks like for me to be living as a Christian. I speak about church and how much I enjoy things there. I speak about my hopes for my children and how I hope that they will follow Jesus. I speak about how Jesus' priorities affect the way that I view things and value things. My encouragement to you is to work at sharing your faith as a natural part of everyday conversations. The second part is explain the gospel. I'm absolutely convinced of the value of learning uh, at least one, even a few different gospel explanations. Once you know a gospel explanation, you'll find all sorts of occasions where it just naturally comes up and you can run through the whole of what Christians believe in 30 seconds, in two minutes, to answer a question, to explain something about yourself. It's worth learning how to explain the gospel. I was chatting with a parent at the school and the topic of scripture in schools came up and they said, do you know what the difference is between the different religions? Funny you should ask, I say. And I had an opportunity to explain the gospel. I love a particular gospel explanation with six steps. I can start with the God who made the world and continue on through sin to the need for Jesus and what Jesus does. I can start with the problems in the world that are due to sin and then go back to the God who made the world and continue through to what Jesus does. I can speak about the hope that I have for the future and how following Jesus affects every part of my life and go back to the God who made the world and sin and our need for Jesus. And the third part is to read the Bible with someone who doesn't believe it. This is my goal in every relationship that I have. The Bible's how God speaks to us. The Bible is God's word. Let me give you an example of how all this happened just this morning in a really exciting way. I was sitting in the foyer at church. A man came in, sat down next to me and asked if I'd be happy to read something that he'd written from his culture. Of course, I say, I take it and read it. It's about money. And I said, thank you for letting me read this about money. Would you be happy to read something from what that I believe about money? Yes, he says. Well, I get my Bible out. I open it up to part of Jesus teaching about money and we read it together. He says, this is really interesting. I said, would you like to know more? He said, yes. So we arranged to meet and then we sat down and we opened up the Bible to Luke. I showed him where the contents page was. I showed him how to turn to the particular page. I taught, explained chapters and verses, and we started reading Luke. We read for an hour and a half, and then I had to go. When we finished, I said, thank you so much for doing this. I really enjoyed it. It was great hearing what you think. I, I'm so thankful that we could read the Bible together. My pleasure, he said. I enjoyed it too. Would you be happy to meet next week? Yes, he says. So pray for me as I meet with this man next week. Friends, it's worth having a pathway in your head to do outreach. 
Share your faith. Make that part of your natural everyday conversation. Learn how to explain the gospel. And third, my goal is to bring people to the Bible, to be reading the Bible with them. If you, like me, want to see people's lives changed by Jesus, then I encourage you to have that pathway in your head. All the best. I'll be praying for you as you go out with the good news of Jesus to see lives changed by Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as Paul prayed for the Colossians, we ask that we and Christians everywhere may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that we may walk in a way worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to you, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. May we be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, for all endurance and patience, with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled us to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. You have rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son you love. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. We thank you that this is the Lord Jesus whose name we bear. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Lord, today we pray for scripture in schools, that the door remain open, and that many kids would come to know and trust Jesus this year. We also pray for members of our church serving in Christian ministry outside our church, in areas like Crusaders, School Chaplaincy, Anglicare. Please strengthen them for their service, and use them to bring the light of your gospel into the lives of our communities. We thank you for the work of our Kids Church and JFT's leaders and pray that our young members might be growing in their faith and love for Jesus, and that our kids and youth ministry might be a real partnership with Christian parents and our Christian community. We ask that every member of our church might grow in their love for others and grow in their commitment to be a relationship builder, so that our present congregation be strengthened in love and new people feel welcomed and part of this church family. We thank you for the work of our Link missionaries, Kristen and Catherine Slack, serving with Bush Aid and leading the church in Catherine in Melbourne Territory. And we pray for faithfulness in this remote area, in working with Indigenous Christians, and we pray for good relational and emotional support for their family in an area which has few young children and little history of systematic Bible teaching. We pray today for Martha Flagmire after the sudden death of her son Herb. Please comfort her in this time of loss and provide for her needs. May she know your love for her and hold on to the hope of the gospel. We pray for friends and former attenders Gail and Rob in the United States and suffering from COVID. Please grant them a quick and full recovery and comfort them in their distress and provide people to care for them. We pray for people known to us who are unwell, for Dave, for Jackie and Ron, and for Mitchell. We pray for them for healing and for patience while they're unwell. We thank you for the privilege we have in being able to meet together safely as your people, which this year has become even rarer in our world. We pray that you would restrain COVID in other places so that more of your people may meet together in safety. Please give, up, give governments, governments wisdom in setting restrictions and people the willingness to follow those restrictions. We thank you for the community spirit shown by Australians in following restrictions here and contributing to the freedom and health we are enjoying as a country at present. We pray that this might continue. We pray all of these things in the great and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's close our time of prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. take a seat. We've got a few announcements before we head out into the beautiful sunshine and grab something to eat and drink. Uh, And the first of those announcements, uh, of course, is that if you are new, uh, we would love to give you something. We would love for you to know more about Jesus. 
Uh, and so we have this little book that is about him. Uh, and as Rick has been explaining uh, up on the screen, and as Glenn has been explaining from up here, the best way to know him is through the Bible. But uh, we would love for you to maybe start a little bit smaller if that's what you would like. So let us know if you would like a copy of these and we can absolutely get it to you, even if you're on a live stream. Otherwise, we'll try and find you ourselves and, and give you a copy. Uh, we'd also love to know what you have to say and what you think. Uh, we have communication cards that are up the back, uh, the little wooden box that's attached to the wall. You can fill one out, hard copy. Uh, if you're enjoying the COVID style of doing things online, you can also do it online via our church website as well. Uh, there's a button as you go to the home screen. Click on that and you can fill out the details that way. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Eat, Meat and Love is back on as well for the women. If you have not been to one of these before, you should go. I haven't been. I can't go. But if it's half as good as what Jesse tells me, then you should absolutely go. Uh, it's going to be at Mez and Me as usual. Thursday the 19th, I believe that's this week, though I'm really bad with dates, so double check that. Um, it's at 7.30, uh, if you need more information like what date is it actually today and what it'll be on Thursday, ask Rhonda, she's really across those kinds of things in general life as well, uh, as well as this event. Today we have heard that if we want transformation, and we all want transformation, the only thing that brings true, lasting transformation is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And that good news of Jesus, that's the glory of God. And by his spirit, we can both experience as well as hold out to others a glorious transformation further into the image of God. Let me pray for us before we head out. Heavenly Father, Please help us to desire the transformation that only you can bring through your gospel. Please help us to be prepared to share our faith with others, to explain it, and to read the Bible. Please help us as we go out this week to dig deeper into the word uh, ourselves, amongst our families, and with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us outside for uh, some... Something to eat.